Welcome to our CTS Net Roundtable. Today we will be discussing on non-technical skills in cardiothoracic surgery. My name is Jessica Luke and I'm a CTS Net resident editor and cardiovascular surgery resident from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Today I am joined by an outstanding group of experts on this topic. Let's begin by introducing our panel. Can you all introduce yourselves? Oh, I start. <laughs> Uh, my name is uh, Tom Burgess. I'm a thoracic surgeon at the University of Utah, and I'm the program director of the Cardiothoracic Surgery Fellowship there. My name is Jennifer Lawton. I'm an adult cardiac surgeon and chief of cardiac surgery at Johns Hopkins. My name is Marianne Smith. I'm a thoracic surgeon at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. I'm Patrick Myers. I'm a cardiac surgeon from Lausanne in Switzerland, and I'm also a secretary of the European Board of Cardiothoracic Surgery. My name is Jason Hahn. I'm a trainee at the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania in the Integrated Cardiac Surgery Program. Great, thank you so much everyone. So many factors influence surgeons' intraoperative performance. Analyses of adverse events have demonstrated that it is often due to breakdown of non-technical factors rather than a lack of intraoperative skill. These non-technical skills include situation awareness, decision making, teamwork and communication, as well as leadership. Surgical training has traditionally focused on the acquisition of clinical skills and knowledge rather than uh, non-technical skills, which are often acquired informally rather than being explicitly addressed. Given the importance of non-technical skills, today we will be discussing non-technical skills that are unique to our specialty in cardiothoracic surgery, as well as how to learn, teach, acquire and assess these skills in our daily practice. Dr. Lawton, um, can you start out by telling us uh, and giving us an overview of what non-technical skills mean to you? And specifically, when you walk into a team environment as a leader, how do you create an environment that inspires others to perform their best? That's a great question. I think of non-technical skills as emotional intelligence and being aware of your surroundings and your team members. And, and cardiac surgery operating room is one of the most intense team situations that you can encounter. Um, you know, we have perfusion, anesthesia, nursing, PA, uh, and a lot of learners oftentimes in that situation. One of the things that I like to do during the timeout situation to sort of diffuse the tension is at the beginning when we mention the patient's name, I say why he or she is here for the operation, something personal. And then at the end, I say, this per every single one of you in the room has a vital role in making sure this patient has an excellent outcome. So, and looking at each one with good eye contact and say, so thank you for what you do and any questions. And that allows each person, each person has already introduced himself or herself, so I know the name, but each person feels um, like he or she can speak up and say, you know, I didn't really understand why we weren't doing this or, you know, so that I think helps a little bit. Thank you very much, Dr. Lawton. And as we know, breakdown in healthcare teams happen with situational and cultural stressors, such as unfamiliar teams, um, emergency situations, complications, time demands. Dr. Myers, can you speak specifically about specific ways that surgeons can overcome breakdowns in teams in high stakes environments, such as our specialty? Well, thank you, that's a very good question. Um, I think the one issue is that um, surgeons have been historically and naturally become leaders in the operating room. Um, that's great, but that's not always the best situation. If we look at um, what Malcolm Gladwell or Tul Gawande have told us about cockpit culture, when mm -hmm. there's a very hierarchical structure in a high stakes environment, such as in cockpits, that can lead to very bad outcomes. Um, notably with Korean Air having a horrendous crash uh, record in the 1990s. Now, how to avoid that is to introduce um, or to uh, acknowledge that we're in a high stakes environment and introduce uh, safe surgery uh, strategies such as uh, Dr. Lauten uh, mentioned previously. The main thing for avoiding breakdown is to plan for that in advance, have this as a, a system and processes uh, that be in place um, and acknowledge that we're human, we're fallible. Um, each one of us can make mistakes and that that is part of the system. And so we have to put in place um, different uh, checkpoints in the system to make sure that, um, that we can allow for these, um, these breakdowns, plan for them, simulate them through crew resource management, 
um, simulations, um, different types of communications, um, and, and other items like that. Uh, and I think our uh, societies, uh, be it the STS, EACTS, have been very, very um, proactive in developing leadership uh, um, uh, classes, like we just had just before STS, um, which can teach us some part of these uh, these skills that are uh, absolutely necessary in our practice. Thank you very much, Dr. Myers. That was very insightful. And Dr. Antonoff, as an educator, how do you teach non-technical skills, such as decision making and leadership to your trainees? That's a really terrific question. I, as you pointed out, during surgical training, we tend to have the trainees spend most of their time in the operating room learning the technical skills, when as a practicing surgeon, we don't spend all of our time in the operating room. There's a lot of other places where we are and other ways that we spend our time. So I think, first of all, just exposing them to what our daily practice includes. Um, it's, I think it's very important to get the residents to the clinic, number one, to learn decision-making. As, as a surgeon, a lot of your decision-making happens in the clinic. And um, once they've already made it to the operating room, it's obvious to the resident that the patient needed that operation, but they also need to see the patients who don't get to the operating room. So being involved in that decision-making and understanding the process. There are also a lot of other aspects of um, communication that take place in the clinic. And I've actually heard from residents that sometimes the most helpful um, discussions in the clinic are not the ones where we're looking at the images and deciding what operations to do, but rather ones where I'm explaining to a family member why I can't offer them surgery or explaining some of, to the people some of those difficult conversations or all of the team members that are involved in their care um, and some of the leadership that takes place in the clinic is, is really important. Um, I would also encourage people to bring residents to other parts of your day, even if you've had an adverse outcome and you're going to speak to the family, bring the resident along. Um, have them engage in all those different aspects. Um, if there is a conflict between different specialties and specific patients' care, those are the types of conversations that you want to be informed to the resident about what's going on. Uh, likewise, in the operating room, even decisions about the technical component, um, they often see what steps we decide to take, but even just talking through your rationale for making specific decisions in the operating room is helpful not only for teaching the resident, but it brings the whole team on board so that your scrub tech and your nurse and your anesthesiologist and everyone else who's really critical to the safety of that patient also know what's going on. And then um, I guess I would also say, with regard to leadership skills, we talk about, a lot about the importance of journal clubs to learn the seminal literature in our specialty and learning you know, when we should do a cabbage on pump versus off pump or whether we should give induction you know, chemotherapy prior to doing the lobectomy or not. But I think it's also an opportunity for teaching some of these non-technical skills. We're obviously all pulled in many different directions, but I have found that doing kind of specialty, um, specialty journal clubs where you talk about leadership skills or talk about um, some Harvard Business Review articles about in interacting with other members of the team. That can also be a way to get residents thinking about some of those components of the actual non-technical experience during their training. Wow, thank you very much, Dr. Antonoff. That's an incredible list of, of things that we can, ways to teach uh, residents. And I certainly have been very blessed to have uh, mentors and my um, uh, surgeons that I work with who have involved me in aspects like that and I have definitely found that those have made me not just a better surgeon and doctor but also a better person. So thank you. And Dr. Varghese, can you tell me about some ways that we can assess non-technical skills and in addition how ways that we can build upon uh, areas identified for improvement? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for the question and thank you for the opportunity to engage in this panel. I think that if you take a step back, kind of summarizing some of the comments that have been made, we're really talking about uh, decision making and teamwork. And then when you think about that, what's the organized framework for that? What you need is opportunities for observations, uh, opportunities to rate uh, the learners. Did they do it well? Did they not do it well? But the third is also the key thing, is we need to set up an opportunity for feedback. And feedback has to be objective, it needs to be timely, but then the third piece is key. It need, you need to give the opportunity for the learner to, for improvement. So when you think of that framework, uh, there's a couple different things that uh, we need to uh, concentrate on. Um, one is uh, you can use a formalized curriculum, the NOTS curriculum, uh, which stands for Non-Technical Skills for Surgeons. This was developed at the University of Aberdeen as well as the Royal College of Edinburgh. And then Stephen Yule, Dr. Stephen Yule, who was critically involved in developing that, brought it over to the United States and worked with Dr. Doug Smink at the Brigham. So the goals there are, it's the setting is inside the operating room where they're assessing decision-making and teamwork. 
The other way outside of the operating room includes uh, assessments like 360 degree feedback. This is an opportunity where you interrogate or you ask members of the team, how did this learner do? And then you collect that from multiple different points of view so that it's more than one assessment with a rating scale. And then again, sit down with the learner and say, this is the observations that were done about your particular skills in teamwork, decision making, and here's the opportunities to improve. We actually have some savvy things. There's something called the OR Black Box, which was developed at the University of Toronto, which is a very objective collection of data. If you think about the black boxes in the airplane, when a disaster happens, somebody had mentioned Korean Airlines before, when a disaster happens and the plane crashes, the black box is supposed to be indestructible, but it's constantly recording the data, what's happening, so that the investigators can piece together what happened after the event. Same way in the operating room, if there's an adverse event or a situation, if you're objectively collecting the data, this gives you the opportunity after the event to do a debrief and then give the feedback. So I think that whatever instrument that you use, it's really those three things. It's are the observations occurring and you're objectively collecting the data? Is there a rating system? Did the learner do well or not? And then that third key piece is opportunity to give the feedback back to the learner. Wow, thank you very much. And Dr. Han, you are midway through your cardiothoracic surgery training. Can you share with us ways that you are cultivating your non-technical skills during training? Yeah, thank you for the question. And it's very reassuring to be in a company of established surgeons who have such important insights about this subject and just acknowledging it outright. Because I think as a trainee, you come into the process thinking that you're going to be undergoing a technical transformation, but there's always a realization at some point in your career that you're actually doing so much more than that, coping with some of the experiences that you've never anticipated having and becoming better as a person out of it and not just a better technician. And I think as a trainee, the first step would be in acknowledging that this is a whole aspect of training that needs to be addressed very uh, intentionally through reflection. Uh, and we, uh, our colleagues at, at Penn did that recently. The trainees got together and analyzed a lot of different speeches that were written by uh, former presidents of AATS and STS, and you realize that almost none of those speeches address some technical aspect of their career, but but, but really focus on some of the things that, that made them a better person as a result of, of reflecting on it, how, how they became a better leader, how they became someone who balanced their priorities uh, in a way, to how, how, how certain moments humbled them, what philosophies guided them, and I, I think just taking the time to have reflected on those things made us more holistically aware at the end of it and kind of renewed our passion for what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, made us focus on different aspects of patient care and different aspects of operating in the OR, just simply because we acknowledge that in the process. And I think if we were to keep up the habit as trainees of reflecting on these kinds of, kinds of topics throughout the process, then hopefully we can emerge at the end of it, not as someone who just knows how to operate, but who can perform so many roles that, that the leaders have already done so, so effectively. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Han. Um, and for a question for everyone, um, are there any unique non-technical skills that are specific for your areas of subspecialty or career stage um, that you would like to share with us? And any closing thoughts on non-technical skills in CT surgery? Well, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll start. I, I think that the stakes are higher in our specialty in cardiothoracic surgery. It's not to disparage any other specialties or anything out there, but the stakes are higher because a wrong decision can lead to a critically bad outcome for a patient. Um, you know, it is life or death situations. And so that means that we have to come up with the assessments that are really timely. And I, it, it, this is very critically important that we get this right. Um, and I think that that's the key thing, the difference in our specialty versus others. Uh, you know, a wrong decision, uh, you know, can lead to the death of a patient. And obviously that's the worst outcome for everybody. Um, and so we need to do things to be proactive and, need, and see how things are. So I think even though there are other surgical specialties that use similar instruments and assessments, I think the stakes are much higher in our specialty. I would agree with that. And I, I think it's, it's interesting. Some of the skills that we need to cultivate deal with this balance between taking responsibility as the surgeon and the leader but also having every member of the team feel that they're an important part and that they contribute. Absolutely. And it's a very delicate balance, but when I have a great outcome, I make it clear to the patients and to the team that there's no way I could have done it without them. But when I have a negative outcome, I wanna take full responsibility by myself, 
which is, is what I think one needs to do, um, recognizing that there are many contributing factors, but I think one needs to really be able to work on that that humility and the responsibility when things don't go well, because we ultimately are the leader of the team and we need to um, support everyone when there's been something that hasn't gone well, but make sure everyone understands their contribution when things do go well. Correct, and I think that uh, one of the comments that people, multiple people have made is creating that environment of psychological safety so that members of the team not only are encouraged to, but graciously offer their feedback uh, to, to the team. I mean, because it, we, we celebrate it as a team and uh, um, oftentimes the setbacks are a lonely experience, but yeah. you know, that, that's the way that we get better at this. And we traditionally as a specialty have not been particularly good at this part of our job. We've not been open-minded, we've not been mm -hmm. listeners. And so one way that we can get feedback, particularly as leaders in the operating room and leaders of multidisciplinary teams is a 360 where if you, uh, oftentimes a coach can help too, if you get a 360 back or multiple 360s from all the groups of people that you work with, and then actually honestly listening to what they say and, and, and really putting that into practice every day can be very helpful. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. I certainly learned a lot from this round table and from all you experts on this panel. I hope everyone uh, found this round table insightful and thank you very much for joining us today.